You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, we'll be bailing out in Fab Facts. We're making movie magic in the randomizer. And we continue our geek out with Mark A. Altman. Oh, can't wait. That's all coming up in pod 168 of the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, hello. Is that Richard James? Yes, is that Jamie Anderson? Uh, speaking, uh, how are ah, you today? Yes, I am well. I am hearing you clearly. Good. Loud Over. and clear here also. Over. Uh, now, we're here. Hmm? I don't know why we're doing uh, no. RAF uh, radio telephone operator Strange, impressions. Strange, isn't but, it? Uh, yes, we're here for the Jerry Anson podcast. Um, oh, and yes. you already know who we are because we've introduced ourselves to each other ah. and to you. Yes. Um, you are a podster on because you're listening to the Jerry Anson podcast. And yep. uh, as well as Richard and I, we are also joined at a distance, I should say. Oh, yes. This time. Yes. Uh, I should hope so. <laughs> By Chris Dale, who he's wearing a, sw- a sweatband around his head. He's got one on each he wrist, yeah, and he seems to yeah. be warming up for something. Oh, he's he's getting ready for something, isn't he? He's doing a tough mother or something. I think he might be I this no way. No idea. Oh, hang but on, like he's off. That. He's off. Oh, oh, okay. Chris, come back. Wow, beat me back in time yeah, for the random. He's got a good speed on, hasn't he? He has. Disappearing into the distance, I can I there can barely goes. see him now. Well, hopefully, Chris. Chris will complete whatever he's up to uh, by the time we get to the randomizer at the end of this uh, podcast, yes, when yes. he discusses yep. a random Jerry Anderson episode chosen by the randomizer, which is his yep. machine. Uh, what else yep. we got coming up in this week's Jerry Anderson podcast, Richard? Fab facts, newsy news, news, news. Second part of interview with Mark A. Altman, Podstron's emails, Facebook group, and Twitter. Great. All rounded up by the randomizer right. and some end of credits, post credits bands. Yes. Yeah. Good. That, that was just nice, pure, clean, and simple. You see, it was like a, a menu in a restaurant. I just thought I'd give it like it was. Is that the theme for this week's episode? Is it, it could nice be. and clean and simple? Yeah, clean and simple. Okay, right. Well, right. on with the so, show. On uh, that note. Proceeding yep. with this week's Fab Facts. Mm. Well, you did say simple. Now, time for this week's Fab Facts. Fab Facts. Stars, yep. a book of fab facts, Richard Chad's mm-hmm. fab, while I'm flicking yep. through it. That makes me stop flicking and then I read you a fab fact. Yep. Here we go for yes, this week's right. fab fact. Fab! <laughs> Ooh. Oh. oh, God, there's a picture of Joe 90 on this page. Oh, crikey. Oh, dear. Bit early for that. Oh, I know. Mm. Okay, anyway, well, I'll try and get over that. But, uh, Richard... If you were at the controls of an aircraft that had just been hit by enemy fire, it's lost all control and there's nothing you can do to stop it smashing into the ground, what would you do? Oh, well, uh, I think I'd probably pull a lever and bail out. Absolutely. You would certainly yes. eject. Uh, you would yes. want to get out of that aircraft pretty darn quick. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yes, yes, I would. And you'll be pleased to know that ejecting... Mm is the theme of this week's Fab Fact. Is it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, very often in Captain Scarlet and Joe 90, if people got into difficulties in their aircraft, they would eject to safety. Yeah. Think of the Angel Interceptors, for instance. Uh, If Uh one of those got shot down, the pilot would obviously eject. Yeah. One thing you may not realise, but it's going to be very obvious once we say it, Mm. is that for many of those shots of pilots ejecting from their aircraft... The models of those aircraft were actually being flown upside down. What? So Wow. Well, what would happen, you see, is you'd have ah. the model being flown upside down, yes. maybe with smoke pouring out of it. Love um, it. And then at the right moment, first the cockpit canopy of the model would be yeah. released, which would yeah. then fall to the studio floor. Yes. yes. And then the miniature figure of the pilot inside the model would also be released and fall to the floor then obviously you just turn that footage upside down and suddenly you have a shot of a pilot ejecting from an aircraft oh, they were great. so clever on those shows I weren't like they that. yeah yeah 
the earliest example of this that we can find is in Thunderbirds Edge of Impact. Uh, when the pilot of the red arrow ejects to safety. We must stress that that's the earliest that we can find, but not necessarily the earliest actual example full stop. As with many of the breakthrough effects techniques on these shows, they were probably being used in some form or another much earlier than we think they were. Um, yeah. But generally, before Thunderbirds, if someone needed to eject from their aircraft or spaceship, either you would see the puppets ejecting from the, co the cockpit, but with no corresponding model shot of their vehicle, uh -huh. Um, yeah. as in the first episode of Fireball XL5, or okay. you cut from a shot of the puppet ejecting to a suddenly empty model, as in the Stingray episode, Rescue uh, from the Skies. Yes, yes. With yes. Thunderbirds, though, they finally seem to have cracked it, and with Captain Scarlet and Joe 90, suddenly you'd see a lot more ejecting shots. And they obviously decided, well, we, we know how to do it now, let's do it all the time. Uh, mm -hmm. But the technique wasn't perfect. What gives it away is that sometimes gravity would act on the ejecting pilots in a way that it wouldn't do if they were travelling straight up rather than down. Okay. Most notably, there is an episode of Joe 90 called Arctic Adventure, which opens with the crew of a bomber ejecting before it crashes into the Arctic wastes. Mm -hmm. As the miniature figures of the pilot and co-pilot eject, the co-pilot figure seems to catch his feet on the model which causes his chair to flip over in such a way that it looks like he's, eject he's ejecting upside down. Now, that's getting confusing, uh, isn't it? Filmed upside down. Yeah, like yeah. He was yeah. Anyway, but again, yeah. a remarkably simple technique that went on to be used elsewhere in the effects industry, including later Anderson Productions, uh, up to uh -huh. and including Space Precinct. Oh, really? So, wow. Richard James, it's time oh, for no. a quiz for you. <sighs> oh, gosh. Are you ready? Mm, go uh, on, what? In which Space Precinct episode oh. did the FX team show characters ejecting from a doomed vehicle by hanging the model upside down, releasing the ejectable oh. section, and letting gravity do the work? I, don't, I mean, I've got a 1 in 24 chance, haven't I? Well, no, because um, you were in it, so you should know. Well, which really? It was. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, there was a chase sequence in just about every episode, really, yeah. but I'll say, I'll say one of the early ones Predator and Prey. How's that? Uh, uh. Uh, protect and survive? Uh, uh. Oh, go on. One more guess, go on. The power. Uh, uh. Yeah. Oh. No, I'm afraid oh. it was Smelter Skelter. Um, oh, right. Brogan and Haldane's cruiser is caught in the wake of a smelting ship and they eject from the, the cockpit from the rest oh, of the ship. Yes. Remember that whole cockpit yes, section? Yes, the cockpit, the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, yes, and as I the see. cockpit section falls into camera, the weight of the emergency lights on top of it is clearly causing uh -huh. it to tilt to one side, which wouldn't oh, happen right. if it was traveling straight up. So another giveaway of the <laughs> okay. technique right there. Okay, yeah, yeah, interesting. Such That's a great technique. Yeah, I mean, it's that way of thinking, I think, which really made people like Derek Meddings... Uh, Brian Johnson and Steve Begg, yes, the yep. experts in their field, because they 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 wouldn't be constrained by, yeah, that is up on the camera and that is down. That's right. They would put the camera on the floor, pointing up to the sky, yeah, like uh, Brian did with uh, the space explosions in space nineteen ninety nine. Do all sorts of, uh, of wine backs and, and yeah. multiple exposures. I mean, incredibly, incredibly clever people. Simple yet elegant solutions. It's rather nice. It's, I've been watching uh, Robin of Sherwood, 1980s series with Michael Prade <laughs> on ITV4. Yes, because I remember it, you know, from back in the day, and thought I'd give it another watch. And uh, I was doing a bit of reading around, and a, a, a similar thing has occurred there in that they've had to come up with a, a very simple solution to a problem. So they used real castles uh, while they were on location, but of course, castles nowadays are rather tumble down and don't look like the castles did in the you know 11th mm. or 12th century. So they came up with a rather elegant and simple solution. In the back of uh, some shots, you will see teams of extras looking like they are building uh... and fixing holes in the castle walls. Amazing. It's quite nice, isn't it? <clears throat> That's a great and idea. And I like that. It's a similar thing, isn't it? That being able to look at a problem from a from a certain angle and come up with an elegant and simple solution. Yes. That is nice. brilliant. Yeah. Well, very clever, all the people who come up with those solutions. Yes, um, aren't they? Impressive stuff. Yep. Yep. Now, Richard, mm. I think we should probably bring this fab fact to a <gasps> close. So... Right. That's the end of this week's... Ejection, Ejection fact. fact. Okay, we were, we were on the same lines today. That's that's a relief. <laughs> Thankfully, oh, I like that. I love it when we talk about the tricks of the trade like that that mm. you only notice when you know. I'm going to yes. be looking carefully for those next time. Uh, talking of looking carefully, I've been looking very carefully in our email sack. Well, have and you? Been, yeah, it's quite full. I didn't I have to look that Keep far. Keep emailing us. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, at Jerry, uh, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Yes. That is, uh, for example, Rob Pollard emailed to say. 
Hi, Jamie and Richard. Having listened to the audio of Terror from the Stars Ooh, many yes. times, I finally received the new hardback and an original 60s copy of the same book, differently ah, titled, nice. on the very same day. Very spooky, he says. And he sent us a nice picture saying, keep up the good work with the podcast, which I listen to at work, and I will include pics of both, which indeed he did. And thank you for those, Rob Pollard. We have another one here from Chris Turner. Dear Jamie, Richard and Chris, I've just finished listening to the audio book of Five Star Five, John Lovell and the Zargon Threat by Richard James and read by Robbie Stevens. This is such an excellent production. The action is fast paced uh, uh, and I love the way the opening chapter throws you straight into the action and feels slightly disorientating like a good Steven Spielberg movie. Oh, and it's nice. only later in the story yeah, that the significance of the opening scenes become clear. Robbie Stevens is the perfect narrator. His range of voices is astonishing from the world weary John John Lovell to Clarence with his lisp and the booming voice of Rudy the Robot. It's almost like listening to a full cast audio drama. The sound design by Benji Clifford is just right, adding layers of depth to the narrative without being intrusive. He says, because the script was written in the 1970s, it's rather inevitably been dubbed Jerry Anderson's Star Wars, but I think a closer comparison might be Guardians of the Galaxy with that almost magnificent Seven vibe, yeah. a disparate band of unlikely mm. characters coming together to fight for a common cause. So, he says, it's definitely five stars from me. I'd love to see or hear more from this crew and could see this franchise branching out into other media such as a graphic novel and maybe even a five-star five vault. Well, I can wish. Uh, finally, says Chris Turner, after listening to Jamie's Q&A session on Anderson in Insiders recently. Oh, yes. All I can say is I'm really looking forward to all the great new content coming our way. Oh, yes. Keep up the great work. Mm, Best wishes from Chris Turner. Hooray. Well, so, been spilling the beans, have we, Jamie? Uh, only a few beans were spilled. Okay, okay. Good. So, Very nice. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, that's, that's the benefit of Anson Insiders, I guess. Yes, there we are. Uh, Stephen Watson says, Hi, Jamie, Richard and Chris. I've never heard this mentioned before or ever even heard of it. Maybe some investigation is required. And he sent me a link to an article about a Thunderbird 2 camper van. And the link says, uh, oh, there's a little yeah. article there saying, There can be little doubt that this is the best camper van for sale in the world right now. There are better equipped campers out there, of course, but you can't beat this one for curb appeal. It's the only Thunderbird 2 van that was ever built. It's in fantastic condition throughout and it's for sale. It's uh, 100% road legal conversion from a bespoke uh, metal body based on a 1994 Toyota Previa. Uh, it's got eight windows at the front, two in the front uh, of the driver have windscreen wipers and there are two circular ports on either side. Entrance and exit is by gullwing doors to either side. Anyway, you can see all of this simply by googling Thunderbird 2 Campervan. And you could take a look yourself. It's a really interesting thing. Have you seen it, Jamie? It is interesting is the right word. Yeah, I, yeah I, that's right. I don't think it's that appealing. <laughs> ah, um, well. It's quite, a, it's quite an unpleasant green, I think. It is, yeah, that's it's true. It's not a Thunderbird 2 green. No, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, I bet it is pricey. Oh, yeah. And uh, finally for now, Hugh Porter got in touch to say, hello, Richard and Jamie. I have one question to ask. Okay, He says, I know that Anderson Entertainment don't own the 2015 series of Thunderbirds Argo, but is there any way you could contact ITV Studios and ask if they can release season three of the Thunderbirds Argo in Australia on DVD so it could complete my collection and many others around Australia? It's annoying that they've released season three in the United States and United Kingdom, but not a region four DVD for Australia. This would be great if you can do it. I know that Anderson Entertainment and ITV Studios are in great partnership with each other. Thanks in advance, if possible, from Hugh Porter. Uh, so, Hugh, I, I made a quick inquiry on your behalf, and oh. uh, it's it's a locally decided thing. So ITV Studios okay. can't make it happen. If you yeah. look, look on the, the, the Volume 1 and Volume 2 sets, you should see who is responsible for the production of it and the releasing of it, and it's them that you need to contact. So okay. no, nothing I can help with, I'm afraid, yeah. but I yeah. did try. Yeah, well done, Jamie. Good. Forever trying. <laughs> uh, so there we are, all for now, but a little later on, I You're will be reading so out, rude. of course, <laughs> your Facebook posts and some uh, tweets and YouTube comments as well. Yes. <laughs> well, I look forward to those, honestly. Yes. Um, should we have some Jerry Anderson news before this descends <gasps> into a, a, a fight? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Here we go. Here's some Jerry Anderson uh, news, uh, news, 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 I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah. uh, here we go. 
So let's start with this. It's some very quick news this week. The Thunderbirds and Space 1999 Collectors badge sets are in stock and shipping now. If you've already ordered one, then go. Uh, then they should be arriving with you very, very soon. Oh, nice. If you haven't ordered one yet, then do not delay because there are only 500 sets of each available. 12 pin badges in each. Some uh, logos and emblems that I don't think have ever been released before, so they're rather cool. Space 1999 fans, the Moonbase Alpha Technical Operations Manual has been teased somewhat. You may have received an email over the weekend from us Mm -hmm. uh, asking for your opinions about things that you want to see uh, in the book, which will be uh, available for pre-order in this September, uh, just a few weeks' time. If you haven't seen that survey, just have a look on social. It'll be somewhere. Or email us and we'll uh, get it to you, podcast at jerryanderson.com. Also, Thunderbirds and Space 1999, uh, International Rescue and uh, Moonbase Alpha notebooks are available very, very shortly. And just so you know, we're working on something really rather special in the background. Mm, Interesting. Not something that you would have expected, perhaps, but something which we will be able to talk about very, very soon. Lovely. I've spent a very, very special few days over the last couple of weeks uh, on this project and... uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. That sounds great. That's all I can say for now. Uh, More very soon. But that's it for this week's Jerry Anderson News. That was the news. That was the news. (laughs) It was. You're right. It was. Yeah. Why did you laugh? What a lovely... I I don't know. It just surprised Uh, me for some reason. mm, Yeah, I bet you sung it 165 times. (laughs) You didn't start it, it at Well, I know that's why, but this is pod, what, 168 or something, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, don't know think when you I started. started that. Someone did yeah, find out, wasn't it? Was it yeah, pod 14, did, yes. maybe, or something? Well, I tell 29. you what, if you know which pod someone emailed us in to let me know when I started singing that, <laughs> let me know what pod that was so I can listen back and I'll tell you. Okay, okay, perfect. It's a bit uh, at uh, newsy news 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 at jerryanderson.com. <laughs> Uh, good luck with that okay Uh, have you been hearing from Podstrons this week well yes I have specifically on our very own Jerry Anderson podcast official listeners podcast group now you set the cat among the pigeons a little bit Jamie oh no uh, did I a few weeks ago well Isabel Saucier has posted no of course not Uh, she says I'm listening to Pod 165 and I was wondering are there really only 10% of us women fans out there I know it's not the first time the subject of merch appealing more to us is brought up and the answer is always pretty much a variation of there aren't enough ladies is it really the case or are we just more silent because we feel we're not included much and we just give up at some point I know I've resorted to making my own homemade merch more than once because I'm not into models and the shirt designs in the store don't always appeal to me and I know I'm not the only one many if not most of the fanfic writers and fan artists are women at the beginning of the pandemic many of those who held the group up and provided the podstrons with entertainment in various forms were women we are there we want to participate and be included says Isabel Saucier Quite right. And we it's a difficult it. one, though, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Now, I'm I'm not basing it on interactions, because actually I would say that the the female fans are probably more vocal. Yeah. Uh, a lot and of the more time. More creative, certainly. Or, yeah, yeah, potentially. Um, yeah. But I'm, I'm going by demographic data, which is presented to us by the platform. So that's people who are yeah, consuming right. or interacting with our content. So it's not about how vocal people are. It's literally, yeah. that's the percentage that are consuming the content i would love yeah. to redress the balance and uh yeah any female yeah. fans who've got any ideas about how we can uh, do some stuff that's more appealing to yeah. uh to female fans generally that would be great email us podcast yeah. at jerryanson.com there we go mark perkins posted five years ago today i just happened to be in town for the premiere of the new thunderbirds episodes and what a celebrity guest list my ander obsession wasn't as advanced as it is now and that's changed partly due to this brilliant podcast and partly due to the wonderful podstrons i've met over the last few years oh, fab brilliant. from mark perkins yeah lovely simon morris fascinating fab facts on xena ralph says simon and at a whistle from richard james of the theme from the prisoner i was reminded straight away of a chap called john legu uh, i think who worked worked in the art department on some of the Anderson puppet shows and as a set dresser on some of the last Prisoner episodes to be shot. Surely this would have meant he had a similar job to Ralph, putting that subtler realism into the way the sets in the Anderson world were presented to the viewer. So darn good, it's damn near invisible. He was a fascinating chap, having worked on everything uh, from the British Blue Streak rocket to Bullseye with Jim Bowen, and according to the Fanderson website, secured his job on Thunderbirds after writing to Jerry Anderson to complain that the aircraft flight decks were unrealistic. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that worked out well, didn't it? Yeah. 
Good job. Trevor Knight posted, I revisited the Time Machine Museum in Bromyard, Herefordshire last week. Just like the TARDIS, it's much bigger on the inside than the building suggests. And although primarily dedicated to Doctor Who, there are some terrific Anderson TV props and exhibits, a fantastic nostalgia fest, uh, fest and well worth a visit. And finally, uh, Alex Patrick on this week's Randomizer. The puppet that plays Dr. Clam is one of my favourite revamps. Like most of the new ones for Joe 90, he looks really charismatic and doesn't come off as generic. Uh, While we're on that, uh, says Alex, one thing I love about Joe 90 and the Secret Service is while most of the revamps are clearly carried over from Captain Scarlet, there seem to have been a greater effort to disguise them and make them into memorable guest stars. Yeah, hmm. Interesting point. If you have any comments or thoughts on any of those things or more, well, why not join our Facebook group? Just head on over to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash podsterons, answer a few questions, and we'll let you in to join in with the fun. Yes. Are you still gatekeeper yes. there, or is it Louise who's gatekeeper nah, these days? That's Louise now. The lovely Louise who does a, a splendid job. Yes. Not that there's much gatekeeping needed, to be honest. But No, yeah. absolutely not. But yeah, we just, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't yeah. want any spammers in there, do we? No, we don't want just anybody turning up. I mean, we're, we're the only spammers, really. Yes, uh, audio it, exactly. spammers, you and me. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. Mm. Look, I'm, I'm slightly concerned that uh, the randomizer has not returned from his no. whatever he's doing yet. I know. Where's he gone? Um, well, Can't hopefully, even see him on the horizon. I know. Well, hopefully yeah. he'll be back at some point uh, during yep. or immediately after uh, our interview this week. Oh, yes. Uh, yep. It's part two with Mark A. Altman, um, producer, oh, director, writer, uh, raconteur, science fiction fan, nerd, and host of uh, a rival podcast uh, about mm-hmm. Star Trek. But we can talk about that later on. Let's have part two of my chat with Mark A. Altman. Speaking of which, and you probably will be able to speak to this in a different way to most, year one versus year two and, and Freddie Freiberger's arrival. Um, yeah. Mark, and I, I know that, that he has a similar link into uh, the Star Trek universe too. So, I mean, in terms of parallels between the changes that were brought on by Freiberger in both both shows. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, what you know, what I you mean, like the... The one-two punch of Fred Freiberger on 1999, Star Trek 1999, gave him that reputation as a show killer. Yeah. And one of the great quotes of all time that I ever heard was something he said to Ed Gross, who I wrote the uh, 50 Year Mission with. And he, 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 the quote was this: He said, um, "You know, I was I spent three years in a German prisoner of war camp after I was shot down during World War II." And he said, "But the worst experience of my life was still having to live with Star Trek fans after 20 years." Uh, you know, <laughs> and so like he's literally saying that the hate that he got over Star Trek was worse than being in a German prisoner war camp. That's crazy. That's uh, crazy. That is quite significant. So he was really aware of how oh, he was aware of the vitriol were. towards him. Yeah. I don't yeah. know as much as Space 1999, but I think he knew because, you know, he he had that reputation of that moniker as the show killer. Whereas it wasn't really quite accurate because he had a lot of shows that had been successful and shows he started on, but it was Star Trek and Space 1999 that cemented that reputation yeah. as the show killer. But w- was it a similar approach to both shows from him that that gave him that reputation, or is it just two two bits of bad luck and they've stuck in people's memories more than most? I think the problem was that Fred thought he knew better. He came into these shows. And he thought he knew better than the people who were making the shows. You know, he said, they wouldn't be bringing me in if they weren't working, if the ratings weren't down. So I'm going to show you how to do it right. Mm. So in the case of Star Trek, he's like, this is a show about Kirk, not Spock. You know, and this is a show that's not a comedy. This is a show that should be action. You know, and um, also, you know, part of it is it's um, the show is hanging by a thread. So he feels like he has to do something dramatic. Uh, um to change the course of, 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 of the show with space 1999, I think it was the same thing in a sense, it, as far as he was concerned, it, it, you know, his perception was this is a show that's not working and that he knew better and he knew how to make it for an American audience, you know, because he was an American and American TV showrunner. And, you know, so he basically, you know, just completely reinvented the show mm. and, and um, you know, it's really, Unfortunate because so many of the changes that he made were ill-advised and bad and sort of betrayed the uh, the concepts of the show, which isn't to say there aren't redeeming things about the second season, but, um, you know, it was just so ill-considered. Now, I will say as a kid, 
you know, I didn't hate the second season because like they had lasers finally, you know, and it was a little <laughs> more action packed. Yeah. You know, and, 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 uh, um, you know, there were aspects of it second season that I thought were, you know, that I vaguely remember thinking were, you know, Maya was a very appealing character. Right. But, you know, when you look at it in retrospect, you know, it's like, it's clear, you know, season one towers above season two. It's yeah. so much smarter. It's so much more thoughtful. It's so much better made. The performances are better. It's a more interesting cast, but you know, <laughs> but yeah, Fred, I mean, Fred Freiberger, it, it just, I really think there's an arrogance and it's interesting because I have to give Hart Bennett credit when he came into Star Trek, knowing nothing about Star Trek. And he was, you know, put in charge after Star Trek one went way over budget, you know, and, and it made money, but not enough money for the studio. And when they decide, okay, we're going to do Star Trek two, we're going to do it under the ages of the TV division. We're going to do it cheap. We're going to try and see if there's any life left in this, mm. you know, Hart Bennett didn't know much about Star Trek. So what did he do? He watched all 79 episodes of the original series. And he said, what about these works and what can I, you know, adapt and that's where you know, he comes up with the idea, like for Khan, Khan's a great villain from Spacey, and I'm going to do that. And this is Horatio Hornblower, and I'm going to do that. He didn't try and say, I'm going to make Star Trek my thing. He yeah. said, I'm going to try and take what already works about Star Trek and do it better. And um, that's if Fred Freiberger had gone into Space 1999 and said, what works about this? And, what you know, maybe what can we we do better or, you know, what what you know, rather than it's not working and I'm going to do it my way. I think, you know, you could have had something special that could have gone on many seasons. Yeah. Well, okay, Mark. So you say this, just go with me here. We're going to quantum leap you into the body of Fred Freiberger at the moment oh, he's contra contracted <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to join Space 1999. So you, I'm assuming then you would take the, the method you just proposed, which is to watch what was there, see what's good, see what could be changed. So from your your viewpoint if you had been in fred's shoes at the time what are the things that you th you think are the most long lasting and important and effective from year 1 of, of space 1999 because clearly there are things that have stuck with you and then mm -hmm. where were there kind of some some shortfalls in your opinion and nobody's nobody's going to judge you for this we're not going to call you the <laughs> show killer well look I, there were always you know there were always a couple of episodes that you know even you know then that i love i still love um, that to me, you know, sort of are at the show at the best. Obviously, Breakaway is great, but um, War Games is terrific. Dragon's Domain is terrific. I always loved because it was so mysterious and weird. And I, I, it always stuck with me. And I had to go back and rewatch it years ago because I'm like, I didn't know if I imagined it or, or the episode really existed. Another place, another Earth with the, you know, where, where, the, where they had settled on, you know, the Earth is approach, the, the moon is approaching Earth and they realize that there's another moon and, They've settled there for years, and they're going to be destroyed if things go back to the way they're supposed to be. And uh, I just I found that really creepy and cool. Mm. And I mean, it was something that Deep Space Nine did pretty well in an episode called "Children of Time" as well. I love that. I, and and then um, uh, the Catherine Shell episode, um, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 oh my I'm, god, I'm terrible on sp on space episode. Names, oh good, so. I'm glad it's not just me. But it's, no, I'm, um, I'm no use at all. And it's funny because that was the episode that influenced the look of Free Enterprise. We had this big party scene at the end of um, Free Enterprise, and we told the production designer that we wanted the party decorations to look like the production design from that episode of Space 1999. And they didn't know what it was. And we had to give them our laser disc of Space 1999 as a reference so they could do something redolent of <laughs> it. Um, and the that Guardian the of Perry. Gar Guardian of Perry. There you go. I don't, I'm getting old. I used to have this stuff on the, on the tip of my tongue. But yeah, Guardian period, you know, so I, I feel like, you know, the, the moodiness mm -hmm. and, um, you know, the sort of interesting, diverse cast that, that it had, um, you know, I was always a fan of Barry Morris uh, as Victor Bergman. You know, mm -hmm. I was really sorry to see him leave. I think that, um, you know, look, it's tough because you, you hear the stories that your dad and Sylvia tell about how difficult Martin and Barbara were, yeah. you know, uh, the American stars who thought they who also thought they knew better. And so, you know, it's challenging working with people at the top of the call sheet who are already stars. It's much easier to work with young talent that is indebted to you for giving them an opportunity yeah. than with people who have already had success. Different dynamic. feel like, I wouldn't do that. I, you know, th this is what works for me. You know, people aren't tuning in to, 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 for me to say this or that. 
you know, it's much more challenging. There's a real art to that as a showrunner to have to navigate those waters where you're dealing with egos. I mean, there's an old thing you learn in the showrunner's training program, which is literally a thing the Writers Guild does. Uh, there's an old saying, uh, and this is not true in, in the case of Space 99. The first year of the show belongs to you. The second show year, the show belongs to you and the cast. And the third year, the show belongs to the cast. That's the evolution <laughs> of, uh, you know, and, and the difference, the difference with Space 1999 is it really, it never belonged to you guys. It always belonged to the cast because yeah. you had, you know, these two big stars come in. And, you know, the fact of the matter is, it's not like Martin Lundell came in with the fundamental understanding of science fiction in general. You know, he came in, you know, and then the fact that uh, it's always tough when you have a lead actor, whether it's Shatner or whether it's Martin, who wants to the show to revolve around them that doesn't want to be generous in terms of sharing the screen yeah um with other characters <clears throat> and other actors because you know these shows are built as ensemble shows but then you never really explore the other characters in any kind of depth because the the, the number one on the call sheet wants to be in every solve every problem and and have all the answers and, and so that's challenging so i have a lot of sympathy for you know <laughs> For anyone in that situation but in this case you know certainly your father having to navigate yeah. those waters and it's interesting because i think in a way that's why ufo in a lot of ways was more um egalitarian in terms of everyone having something to do yeah because kind of certainly a dynamic right it was a different dynamic you know um he wasn't an american star uh, at bishop was you know if people knew him, but he was really an American in Paris, in a sense, an American who working in England who would get these roles from time to time, but he wasn't a star. Yeah. So, you know, everyone in UFO sort of got a little piece of the action, whereas on Space 1999, it was very different. And, you know, there definitely is a sense among the cast of a show like that of um, uh, hierarchy. So you yeah. have, you know, Martin and Barbara and then, you know, Barry, who is the star of a hit show, you know, so. And then you you have the next tier and the next tier. And that's difficult because that creates a weird hierarchy on set too. It becomes very clicky. Yeah. And I think they were all very aware of that. All the all the cast members I've spoken to over the years, you know, there was a kind of real forced, enforced deference to Martin and Barbara and a sense that they, if they put a, a foot wrong at any moment, then they could cause problems, which then kind of ripple outwards. So I, I guess there was some tension in front of and behind the cameras for the cast. And a lot That's of times the these actors become more comfortable over time. Like eventually, you know, I think Martin was a very different person by the time he does crimes and misdemeanors and, and Ed Wood and gets his Oscar, you know, you start to mellow out a little bit because you realize, you know, you're, you're, you're the, the grand lion at that point of the, you know, you've done all this stuff. And also he'd been in the wilderness for so long. He'd done so many bad B movies and crap just to make a living <laughs> So then when he finally gets some juicy things to do in the 80s it's mm -hmm. and then the, the 90s, it's like, oh, OK, you know, you can appreciate it. But there's a time early in your career when you have success early in your career where you can't appreciate it. And you just think it's you that you're the reason everything works. You're the reason the show's a hit. You're the reason yeah. you're a star. And, um, you know, also, as much as I love more Landau, like, I mean, he's so brilliant. Ed Wood. he's so brilliant. Crimes and misdemeanors. You know, I've loved him in so many different things. But, um, you know, he's not particularly funny. Barbara certainly isn't funny. So th that's one thing that Space 1999 lacked. You know, people criticize it for lacking some of the, the humor of Star Trek, yeah. you know, which also gives it its heart in many ways. Um, you look at the relationship between Spock and McCoy, where it's very humorous and it could be appear vitriolic. But in a way, that was their way of expressing love. And, you know, Space 99 had a little bit more of that kind of British upper crust kind of you know upper lip uh you know where it's not that kind of emotions on your sleeve yeah um which i think also was a kind of a barrier to entry for certain people yeah it was a colder look and a colder feel i guess and i can i can see why that's a bit of a barrier for people uh, mark which also see... makes it more realistic probably for a space show oh totally right? and that's that's why there's so <laughs> many guys at nasa now who are working at nasa because they fell in love with space watching that there was a there was a realism and a practicality and it appealed to their their inner scientist and engineer just as our as our time ticks away mark i just want to steer us away very briefly from space and ufo are there are there any other anderson shows that crossed into your your path of the time or are you stuck firmly in the sort of 70s live well, action i area? kind of am i mean even though obviously i knew thunderbirds and you know i knew some of the early shows but the super Mario nation shows weren't something that 
were really when I was growing up, they weren't in syndication, at least in New York, to the best of my knowledge. No. So I didn't get exposed to those shows. The funny thing is, the show that really resonates for me, and you're going to laugh, is Space Precinct. Because oh, I'm not going to laugh. That's great. Uh, I love when Space I, Precinct. <laughs> when, I, um, when I moved out here, and it was nice, I became friends. Um, this guy, Alan Spencer, who had created Sledgehammer, really great guy had called me. He wanted me to consult on a sci-fi project he was doing. He'd read my articles in Cine Fantastic, and he was doing a thing called The Tomorrow Man with, I think it was uh, Julian Sands and G. Carlo Esposito or something. And uh, Oh, no, he was doing And he was, I think before that even, he was doing like some kind of comedy sci-fi. Kind. He was doing a lot in the sci-fi space, and he wanted to pick my brain about some stuff. We became very good friends, and I remember one night he called me up, and he said, uh, Mark, you got to watch this new show. And I'm like, "What? what is it? He goes, it's on at midnight uh, on Channel 13. It's called Space Precinct. It's from Jerry Anderson. He said, it's great. It's so much fun. And I, we, we started watching. It. And then he would start calling me on weekends and like be like, are you watching Space Precinct? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I'm like, yeah, I'm watching it. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, I would set the timer on the VCR, you know, to always tape it. And it was just, it was like so weird, but in a great way. It's like, you know, yeah. Hill Street Blues with, with the... <laughs> <laughs> with puppets it was just great and in space and it was just uh i i really i really enjoyed space precinct and uh, i remember when I, I one of my first magazines that i did uh, when i came out here i did a magazine for larry flint of all people called sci-fi universe mm-hmm. and uh, i said we got to do an article on space precinct it's like this show we got to cover it we got to cover it. it's great <laughs> and so yeah i was a big space precinct fan awesome. um it was so bizarre but i love i love that about it yeah, it, it was bizarre and lovely. Oh, my, so my co-host on the podcast, he'll be very pleased to hear all this. Richard pl- played Officer Orin, one of the uh, Creon oh. uh, guys in that. <laughs> and we we first met when he was doing that when I was like 10 years old. Um, and I, I love Space Breeze. I feel like there's so much more mileage. And, you know, it, it just tone and style wise, it was just felt slightly off where it should have been to really hit home. But I, it's I funny because now in the potential. streaming world, it would totally work where everything is a little off and everything's a little weird. <laughs> and it's like, it, you know, the Rick and Morty's and all that stuff. And like it, now it would like totally work in streaming. There it was still like, a you know, in syndication, it had to do a certain number. But like yeah. now we're like in a niche world. I think it could be and where it could be a little edgier and darker and like, yeah, yeah. well, right? I think it could totally work. I was I was chatting only yesterday to the, the guys that uh, hold the rights outside of the UK. And then they they're really super fond of it. So maybe maybe there's another discussion to have here. Oh, that'd be great. I'd love to. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see Space Precinct. It's just like it'd be so cool. It'd be yeah. so. I mean, you know, it's just it's so bizarre. I mean, I look and I know you, over the years, you know, it's been your hope. Obviously, a lot of people's hope to see Space 1999 come back and uh, UFO. I, I really hope. I think those are two amazing franchises, mm. and I think. What's great is that, you know, all over the years is fundamental understanding of like what worked about them and what didn't. So the opportunity to really do them great with the money and the technology today yeah. and kind of going in with an understanding of what's great about those shows and what's enduring, mm. the sky's the limit. It could be amazing. And, yeah. you know, to me, ITV has this incredible franchise on par with Star Trek, you know, if done right. And I hope that the day will come where, they'll realize that, and you know, the, especially a, a lot smaller, more insignificant and unworthy franchises have been done. And I, I, I will, I will leave you with this, this thought. I have to tell you, because this is one of the goofiest things I ever did. Uh, I remember on September 13th, 1999, mm-hmm. this was um, a couple of months after my first movie came out. I got together with a bunch of friends. Uh, it was, I think it was Rob Burnett, uh, my friend, Dan Weber, Steve Melching, a guy named Mojo who did special effects for Pamela five. And we did a marathon of Space 1999 episodes of September 13th, 1999 on Laserdisc. And then <laughs> at about seven o'clock, we all went outside and stood up and looked at the moon to make sure it was still there. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great, wow. that is a great memory. That was, um, that to me was like one of the, it was super, like we did, we must have watched like 10 episodes of Space 1999. And then we just went out and we, we looked at the moon. And it was like, thank God it's still there. Whew. That was lucky. <laughs> Amazing. That's that's kind of a cute image, though, of, uh, you know, some grown men uh, <laughs> yeah, look out, just, just making sky. sure it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, Mark, 
in terms of how much these things influenced you and got you to doing what you do now, kind of is is there a clear thread for you in hindsight or even as you were moving along the actual path itself from loving these shows and and throwing yourself in so deeply into the world of sci-fi to then obviously going straight into m- making your making your first kind of super eight movies and going on to do what you do now is it, i mean was it a kind of something that you you know there was no other path open to you basically oh yeah i mean it was never there was never a question for me that this is something i would do yeah you occasionally get pressure or stuff from your parents so maybe brief dalliance with like being a lawyer or something but you know i was never getting off the track you know i was never yeah. going to get off the track because you know it was a combination of star trek and space 1999 and obviously logan's run and 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 star wars and uh you know these were the things that made me want to do what i do you know and and and, and for a long time even once i broke into tv after free enterprise and you know my movie stuff that um I was doing a lot of procedurals and I was doing like necessary roughness, which you know, I wasn't doing sci-fi. So it was so great to do like librarians, which is more fantasy, but then to do Pandora, which is my first sci-fi show. Mm. And of course the challenge with Pandora is, is, is we have, you know, very low budget. So so much as things I can't do. So a lot of the challenge is just how do I take what little money I have and, you know, sort of the Babylon five thing. So now, you know, my goal is to have a big sci-fi project with a lot, you know, a lot of money so that I can really, you know, do what I want, but, and, and take all the lessons that I've learned from years of watching Star Trek and space 1999 and a lot of these shows and apply yeah. them to a, a big, you know, TV show. Oh, well, clearly that's going to be space precinct. Uh, the, the reason <laughs> I mean, there's no other way now is they will have to make that happen somehow. Um, oh so- my God, space precinct. <laughs> So I'm awesome. going to go and watch an episode now. So, uh, for, for any of our listeners that haven't seen Pandora, what's the sort of, what's the elevator pitch? Well, I mean, people can watch it in the U.S. on uh, Amazon Prime or the CW app, and I mean, in the, in Britain, it's uh, in the U.K. It's on um, a Sci-Fi uh, Sci-Fi UK, and um, you know, but it's all it's you do it, it does really well around the world in U.K., Canada, Germany, but uh, it basically takes place uh, 200 years in the future and um, about these characters who are going to basically a futuristic uh, sort of um, space training academy, and uh, you know, in the new season. It, it, we spend a lot more time in space. It started off as the paper chaser, Harry Potter in the future. And then it really starts to become sort of a Star Trek space, 1999, the second year where we spend a lot more, more time in space. And the third season, you know, the hope is that it's going to be more Starship Troopers. Um, so uh, awesome. we're, we're heading towards a much darker kind of um, third season. So it'll be interesting, cool. but that's also something else I took away from space, 1999. You know, we changed the cast a little bit in the second season. And in fact, when we were making the changes, it was like, I was like, people were a little wary. And I'm like, no, no, Space 1999 did it. And then, you know, when we weren't sure yet if, you know, be a third season, you know, I'm like, we can't be, you know, just two seasons because that happened to Space 1999 and it deserved more. (laughs) So we have to make sure the show goes another season, at least three seasons. So we can be like the original Star Trek. So anyway, it's it's like, I mean, I literally say these things in meetings. Nobody knows what I'm talking about, but at least I do. So, uh, well, I I appreciate the referencing. Absolutely. So uh, there you go. Posterons, go and have a a watch of uh, Pandora on Sci-Fi UK. Yeah. And, you know, we did a really fun episode on uh, Space 1999 and Inglorious Trexperts uh, Mm. a, a month or two ago. And I'd been threatening to do a Space 1999 episode. Everybody said, this is a Star Trek podcast. How are you going to do Space 1999? I said, because I want to. And we Quite did. Right and it was too. a really thoughtful, interesting, fair assessment of, of everything that's great about Space 1999 and a few of the things that weren't, you know, a lot of Fred Freiberger hate. And uh, uh, so that was really fun. And we got a really great response to that episode. And people, you know, joke that I, I can't stop bringing the show, turning the show around, talk about Space 1999. <laughs> so some people are like, this is a Star Trek podcast. Why are you always? And then and other people are like, it's awesome that you talk about Space 1999. And that was a lot of people responding. How can I watch it? And it was like. <sighs> well, I appreciate you spreading the gospel of Moonbase Alpha, Mark. It's really much appreciated. <laughs> oh, um, it's, it's, it's our pleasure. <laughs> Well, please keep doing it. We'll link to that episode in the show notes of this. And finally, you've just come off the back of a very successful Kickstarter project. And yes, oh, I'm glad you brought that up. We're, we're, we're doing uh, we're doing or producing a, uh, um, a, a documentary about the movies, uh, TV, pop culture of 1982, one of the great years for geek 
entertainment, everything from Blade Runner to Star Trek II to E.T. to The Dark Crystal to Poltergeist to, you know, Halloween 3 season of The Witch. And it's also the year that uh, Zaxxon came out on uh, arcades and, and and the Atari 5200 and the Commodore 64 and <laughs> amazing year for music and, and television. It was the premiere of uh, a bunch of shows like St. Elsewhere and, and Bring Them Back Alive versus Tales of the Gold Monkey and all kinds of stuff. And we're, we're, we're so excited. In fact, we just um, launched an Indiegogo that's going to fund post-production because we're deep into production and we need a, a, for clip licenses and stuff, some additional money. So people can check out Indiegogo to... Um, hopefully join the campaign to promote, to, you know, help us uh, finish the film in time for the 40th anniversary of 1982. It's an extraordinary year. It's going to be an amazing documentary. And we get into really some of the really esoteric stuff. Yeah, of course, Conan's there, but so is Sword and Sorcerer, you know, and of course, uh, you know, uh, E.T. is there, but of course we get into Megaforce. And so there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of great stuff, you know, both the, the as they say, the the classics and then the, the you know the low lying fruit and then some of the really obscure more esoteric stuff that made it such a special year. Awesome, all things nineteen eighty two. Sadly, not a great year for Jerry Anderson stuff, but uh, no, no, unfortunately, <laughs> not a lot going on then. But there was plenty else going on. Um, but there have been some great documentaries about Space nineteen eighty nine and about Jerry. Oh, yeah. and, you know, I mean, it's keeping the legacy alive, which is fantastic. Yeah, no, there's a there's a huge amount going on, and hopefully lots more. And hopefully, obviously, our enormous uh, ten million dollar an episode uh, space precinct space precinct revival. Too. Yeah, I know next. it could be the Game of Thrones of 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 of. of, of uh... <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I, I'm, I'm sold already. Um, if uh, listeners want to find you on Twitter, Mark, you're at Mark A. Altman. Is that right? On Twitter and also on Instagram at Mark A. Altman. Yeah. And, Amazing. Uh, and then on Instagram, you can also follow Inglorious Trek Experts and uh, 1982 movie. All the accounts. Go follow them right now. Uh, Mark, <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much for your time. I've really enjoyed our chat. Oh, no, and, it's great. Uh, it's great to see you, Jamie. And yeah. uh, keep the fires burning. I think it's so wonderful that you can honor your dad by doing this and, and and keeping the legacy going and hopefully thriving and long into the future. Thank you very much. Fingers crossed. Cheers, Mark. Great. What a nice chat, yeah. Mark. Thank you for your Thanks, time. Because I know Lovely. how busy you are. Uh, as Mark mentioned, please do pop along to Indiegogo and support his fantastic 1982 movie project about the greatest geek year ever. Yeah, sounds uh, interesting. Follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Mark A. Altman and let him know if you enjoyed his appearance on the podcast. Uh, you can mm-hmm. listen to his uh, his own podcast, Inglorious Trexperts, uh, yeah, we'll wherever do. you get this podcast and others. Good. Meanwhile, people have been posting Beneath Pod 166 on YouTube. I know it's a funny thing, but you can listen to the podcast on YouTube, and a few people do. do. Most people, I think, do the correct thing and listen by their podcast <laughs> All apps. Correct. See, we got admonished <laughs> about this, didn't we? Yeah, we did. But hey, if you want to listen via YouTube, that's absolutely fine. Ian Dealey, for example, posted, great to hear David Monday talk about his uh, love for all things Jerry Anderson, and very much deep joy to have the Secret Service back on the randomizer in pod 166. Uh, Keith Gooch posted another great episode of the Jerry Anderson podcast, with all the usual banter between Rich and Jamie, a fab fact about Zena Ralph, which was actually interesting uh, a great second part of the interview with david monday who probably revealed more than he should have as usual the highlight for me was chris dale's randomizer review this week it was the secret service episode the cure which was hilarious as usual keep up the good work chaps od dylan posted oh how i long for those golden days of the late 50s and early 60s wish we could have frozen times advance back then uh, well, I mean, if they had have done that, we wouldn't be here now, would we, doing the podcast? So, uh, you know. Also, beneath the uh, Stingray Operation Ice Cap excerpt, which also features on the YouTube channel, uh, oh, yes. R. Alley posted, Feels like the new Captain Scarlet is narrating this episode. They always did say the Anderson shows existed in a shared timeline. Uh, that'll be Wayne Forrester, of course. Rail Rocket Ricky posted, I can't wait to hear this new Stingray adventure. When is it due to be released on CD? Uh, and Ox Phantom posted, Hell yeah, this is going to be sick. <laughs> which I think means pretty good. It's a good version. In yeah. modern parlance. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, it should be out on CD uh, around the end of this week or early in the next one, depending on uh-huh. shipping, transport, logistics, that kind of stuff. So very, very soon. Oh, and then um, it's our hope that finally publishing digital and CD versions will be synchronised by the end of October. So that's quite oh, exciting great. too. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's been tough to get that all lined up, but it looks like we hopefully will be doing that very soon. Nice. Good. Did you just see the door burst open? Uh, yes, I did. Oh, <laughs> look. Well, uh, what a state is he in? I know. Chris, it looks like you've been 
swimming in a vat of chocolate or something. I mean, oh, he's yes, absolutely right. His shoes are all covered. muddy up to his knees. And, oh, dear. Sweaty and... Yeah. Well. Well, Chris, well, you'll have to let mm. us know what you've been up to. I think it might have yeah. been a tough muddy, you know. I think it might have been, yes. Well Impressive done. stuff. I've never done one of those mm. myself, but mm. maybe Chris will inspire me to do it. Uh, well, are we sort of wiping the mud off now with a towel? That's Good. my clean towel, Chris. Yeah, no, that's, that's fine. <sighs> okay, well, anyway... Uh, the filthy Chris Dale is here. As He's also known. he is now better known as the Randomizer or the Randomizer General or Archbishop Randomizer himself, uh, and he's here <laughs> with a random Jerry Anderson episode, which he's about to select, even though he's disgusting and filthy. Chris, keep away from me, but over to you. Good evening. Welcome once again to the Ned Cook Show. As you know, Ned has not missed a performance in the last 167 weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, Ned Cook. No, no, hold on, hold on, sorry. It's, uh, it's just, uh, I, I think there's been uh, some mistake here. I'm the one who hasn't missed a performance in the last 167 weeks, actually. You know, with the randomizer. He's just bluffing. It's not possible. Well, I wouldn't have thought it possible either, but uh, here we are, and that's what we're doing. If that's okay with you, of course. It looks as if it's going to be all right, folks. Oh, well, thank you for being so understanding. First of all, we'll explain how this tremendous task is going to be performed. I think after 167 weeks, they've kind of got the idea by now, Ned. How's about you just press the old button there? Wait for it. She's moving. Yes, she's moving. That's it. This must be the most breathtaking moment I have ever experienced. Yes, it is quite a thrill, isn't it? And here comes the printout. Any minute now. And perhaps you'd like to give us some clues as to who is starring in this week's episode. No one knows who they are or where they come from. But come they do. And help they bring. Well, that sounds like... Ah, yes, it's Supercar today. Although this week they're more concerned with helping themselves out of a jam. Here's Supercar, take one. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, come on, it's hug time. Come on, Mr. Announcer, and, and, and Joe as well. Come on, come on, big Ned Cook Show hug. Oh, that's it. Supercar! So, welcome back to Supercar on the Randomizer. Indeed, the final episode of the first season of the series, although I believe it wasn't shown that way. And uh, as it's the final episode... Laboratory. Having a wonderful rest and eating too many of my sister's marvellous wine schnitzel Take great care of Supercar. Signed, Professor Popkiss. Professor Popkiss is not here. It's a wine schnitzel Dr. Beaker. Uh, I think, Jimmy... Uh, I will tell you when you are older. Which is a European dish. Yes, uh, I remember once when I was in Austria. Now, come on, Dr. Beaker. Let's keep on with this routine. Now, presumably that's Aunt Heidi that they're referencing, who uh, later, it turned out, was living quite close by. So I don't know why... I guess they've gone on a family holiday together. I also like that um, the postcard is... The address on it is just... The Laboratory, Five, Black Rock, ten, Nevada. There must only be one. Thirteen. So, with uh, Popkiss away, 15, Beaker seems to be running the place uh, as much as he ever can. Charging two. Five. Nine. Twelve. And of course, we are currently so close to getting Supercar on Blu-ray. It's now only about a month or so away. Very exciting. Because it does look gorgeous in HD. Fire! Ooh, Roger, fire two! Sounds it as well. There. Well, how was that, Mike? I think old Popkiss can enjoy his holiday with the knowledge that the supercar team will carry on regardless. Uh, right, with Mike. With our endless testing of boosters and things. Is that full boost vertical? There, Jimmy. All perfectly simple. Dr. Beaker, you haven't opened the roof doors. Uh-oh. Oh, lots of, uh... <laughs> what looks like a corrugated cardboard has just fallen onto the set. Now who's a fool? Well, Jimmy, repair costs for that are coming out of your salary. Oh, wait, we don't pay you. Well, it can come out of your college fund. Doors. Yeah, there was quite a lot of painting to do on supercar as well. Talking of painting, I'm wondering if that shot of um, the hole in the, the lab roof was a painting there. Dr. Beaker, no one was hurt and there's been no serious damage to supercar. 
And the whole thing strikes me as kind of funny. Yeah, Dr. Beaker. Wait till <laughs> That's Mike's attitude to everything around here. Everything that goes wrong is either just this weary sort of exhaustion or it's kind of funny. He never really seems to get angry with anyone, which is nice. Chums, uh, not to mention this little incident to old Popkiss. Ooh, I just couldn't oh. bear it. So, um, that unrelated bit of business aside, we're now on to the story proper. Mike, it sounds as if he's wrecking the laboratory and he won't let us in there. Oh, Jimmy, I think he's just opening that big crate that arrived this morning. I've been trying to guess what's inside, but it beats me. All right, gentlemen. Uh, you can come in now. Yes, this is another Beaker Gets a New Hobby episode, and it's one of the stronger ones, because he's got a lot of film equipment. Gee, Dr. Beaker, a real movie camera. So this is what all the secrecy's been about? Yes, Mike, uh... Modern scientists uh, use movie equipment to make permanent records of their experiments uh, for reference purposes, you understand. I see. So you're going to film all your experiments, is that it? Uh, precisely. Exactly. Say, Dr. Beaker, now we've got this equipment, couldn't we make a movie? Yeah, what did I tell you about talking, Jimmy? Probably not. Uh, this equipment is to be used for serious scientific work. But, Dr. Beaker... No, Jimmy. I said no. And I mean, definitely, no. Doodly, doodly, doodly. Ah, here we go. Mitch is on sound. <laughs> oh, quiet, please. Indeed, this is the very scene that you may have recently seen on the um, DVD and Blu-ray comparison videos that we put on the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, roll em. One, take one. And I love how quickly Beaker has been sucked into the idea of making a movie about supercar to the extent that the people who came up with the idea namely well that little squirt jimmy Action! and also mike are completely exhausted nine thousand wish they'd never bothered ten thousand fifteen thousand fire one cut it's nice as well that they left mitch on the uh, the sound recording equipment he's doing quite a good job there actually mike, but let's just take one more for luck and they're going again and the hours roll past Oh my goodness, we're now at 11 o'clock, half past nine at night. Roll em. Okay, Dr. Beaker. Scene one, take 104. Mike still sat at the controls of Supercar with that uh, same grin on his face. And this is a nice montage here as well of... Uh, Beaker getting shots of supercar. Again, in HD, the, the wires are, are quite visible on that thing, but I suspect they've always been very visible. And here's a nice piece of library music. I've often heard this piece being used on uh, other ITC shows as, like, circuses and, and so forth. So it does create a nice image of this whole movie production thing being a, a complete shambles. But one that Beaker thinks is uh, is a high and, and worthy endeavour. And a nice just side glance between uh, Jimmy and Mike in the cab there of, oh my goodness, how much longer is this going to go on for? Interesting shot there of Supercar being flown with, uh, with no pilot. There is no pilot, Master Spy. But of course, we, we know they can control it from the laboratory. I don't know why they are. Now it's underwater filming time. Satisfactory. Most, most satisfactory. I don't know how a standard film camera would work underwater. There seems to be no uh, protection afforded to it there, but... Uh, uh, a lot of filming in. I said never mind. Run it and see how it's coming along. Okay, Dr. Beaker. I'll go and lace up the projector. I can hardly... Needless to say... I, I find this most exciting. Mitch is, uh, is helping himself to a huge pile of film. Right, Dr. Beaker. You'll be filming in Hollywood. Oh, yes, that's right. And when I do, you are not invited. And now, folks, you are about to see the latest epic from Supercar Studios in Black Rock, starring the one and only Mike Mercury. He's still excited. After all the hours he's Here put into know, this man. thing. Lights out. But... Very quiet, Jimmy. This is going to be very exciting. In fact, don't say anything else ever again for as long as you live. Mark. I don't remember you filming that. Oh. Curious. Most curious. Footage of a uh, Navy ship at sea. I don't get it, Dr. Beaker. You were always pointing the camera at us. How come you get ships at sea? I, 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 I don't understand, Jimmy. I just don't understand. Hey, hold on. There's something on the soundtrack. 
Here we have the only drawing that we have been able to obtain so far. A of nuclear the latest unit. American Marine Nuclear Power Unit. Our agents are continuing their efforts to get further information, and this will be sent to you as soon as it is obtained. Oh, I just spotted a piece of dust float past. It's been delivered to us by mistake. A piece of ancient dust. And it's obviously film made by foreign agents. You mean spies? We'll have to find out who these people are, Beaker. This information is top secret, and if it got into the wrong hands, it could mean disaster for the U.S. Navy. Oh, no. So that's taken a, a, a very uh, suddenly serious turn. Satellite Film Productions, 34 East 25th Street, New York. Why, Dr. Beaker, these are the people who develop and print our film for us. Oh, <gasps> of course. Business they're in. Yes, Mike. It came nice back by mistake. Filming American top secrets and selling them to foreign governments. Yeah, but why did they send the film to us? Oh, it was obviously a mistake, you little twerp. And a very serious one for them. Gee, Dr. Beaker, it's just like a movie. Yes. But not one you are going to star in. Now what's he up to, Mike? I don't know, Jimmy. Says he's preparing for his trip to New York. What's the plan, Mike? Well, Dr. Beaker is going to take the film back to Satellite Films, Incorporated, and tell him it was delivered to us by mistake. I get it. Which it was. Make out he hasn't looked at the film and doesn't know anything about it. That's right, Jimmy. In that way, he might find out more about the spy ring that's operating from there. <clears throat> this is a lovely idea for a story and one that seems so... Uh, so light-hearted at first, suddenly taking this serious turn. Fired for the city, Jimmy, and for the occasion. Yep, Beaker is now dressed up as a English gentleman. He's got his uh, his bowler hat and his umbrella. Very much a prototype John Steed, in fact, before Steed was uh, even dressing like that. Aren't they, Mike? Yes, Doctor Beaker. Uh, right then, uh, charging both. Right. Which is something I don't feel the character gets uh, enough credit for at this point in the series. Without Popkiss around for this episode, and I think there was one more episode that he wasn't around for. You do get the feeling of um, the the Woodhouse brothers' conception of the Beaker Show, uh, which which was what they wanted to make originally. Oh. What is it, Mitch? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, oh, roof doors, of course. Not a word to Mike about this, Mitch. <laughs> See, there we go. Mitch, Mitch is helpful, pointing out the uh, the mistake. Obviously, uh, Jimmy didn't have the words to uh, to tell him that earlier. I like that actually. Um, Beaker and Mitch have a, a really nice working relationship. And of course, with no pop kiss, we finally have an episode where the whole supercar team is off on a mission, and Mitch is not stuffed in the trunk. He can actually ride along in the back seat, which is nice for him. Because again, I can't believe there's much room in that trunk. Poor old Mitch. I've always said they should just put Jimmy in there instead. Dr. Beaker, when we get to New York, I'm going to land on the roof of Satellite Office Block. Uh, well, Mike, I, I suppose that's one way of solving the parking problem. Yeah, but I've got other reasons. I want to be around when you take that film into their office. And it cuts down on having to create a uh, city set. Well, I make it, um, we should be over the city now. Let's take a look, then. Ooh. Right again, Doc. Some very ropey stock footage, possibly upside down. Thank you, folks. Here we go. And a suddenly flopped shot of the supercar crew. Yeah, that was definitely upside down. How strange. It also looked very ropey compared to the uh, surrounding footage. Anyway, supercar is now landing on the roof of the satellite films building which i believe is uh something they used to do a lot they would just land on top of buildings and it would always be the same building with this uh first time i've ever been to new york i'm landing like this too oh uh, i'm sure we could leave you here if you like jimmy yeah they would always land in front of the same uh background photo of new york i'll come and get you oh don't worry mike i've got everything organized uh, now where's my umbrella umbrella but dr beaker it isn't even raining the trouble with you Americans is you're too practical. It's simply a question of being correctly dressed. 
while everyone else waits on the roof. Yes, Herman. I have just traced the missing reel of film. It has our label on, and I am hoping it will be returned to us. And if it is not? Then we will have to take steps to make sure it is. I understand, Herman. Um, uh, satellite uh, films, I believe, madam. That is correct. Oh, I have a reel of film belonging to you. It was sent by mistake. How very kind of you to return it, Mr... Uh, Beaker. Uh, Dr. Beaker. And this very sinister sounding secretary also looks quite sinister. I mean, for a supercar puppet, she looks quite glam. I wouldn't dream of looking at somebody else's film. When I but the voice and the uh, the slightly unsettling look of the puppet, she's got a very big head. Of you, Dr. Beaker. They kind of work quite well together. Whereas the um, her boss, Mr. Herman Grzynski, that he hasn't seen it. Good. is a fairly standard supercar puppet who doesn't look too bad, to be fair. Selected. I would like to thank Dr. Beaker personally. I'll you in a moment. Meanwhile, extend our usual hospitality. I understand, Mr. Grudensky. Perhaps you would care to take a seat, Dr. Beaker? No, 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 Dr. Beaker. Not that one. Over there. That one is so much more comfortable. The comfy chair? Oh, thank you, madam. You are most kind. But of course, it's a special trick chair. Are you quite comfortable there, Dr. Beaker? Oh, quite. Oh, quite comfortable. I am so glad, Dr. Beaker. <laughs> <laughs> uh... Oh, the secretary has a control panel on her desk with buttons one to and trap. I also really like that around the walls of her office you can see photos of uh, AP Films crew members. Uh, um, there's uh, Roger Woodburn and uh, Mary Turner and uh, I think there's one of a couple of puppeteers up on a gantry. I'm getting worried about Dr. Beaker. He's been gone a long time. Yeah, I make it 35 minutes. <laughs> Jimmy, you stay here. I'm going to investigate. Oh, can't you take Mitch? With him. I tell you what, though. You can get out a supercar and play around on the roof for a while. But don't fall off. <laughs> yeah, okay. That's, um... Hmm. Well, Beaker has now found himself in a, uh... Mm -hmm. cellar? Interesting. With a load of filing cabinets marked spy. It's of an international spy ring. Ooh, how exciting. Like, I expect he'll shoot down at any moment. <laughs> oh, I'm going to die. Good afternoon, ma'am. I'm looking for a friend of mine, a Dr. Beaker. Dr. Beaker? Yeah, yeah. Uh, bowler hat, rolled umbrella, all that jazz. Oh, yes. You say he's a friend of yours? Yep, that's right. Oh, yes, sir. He is just talking with Mr. Gradensky. Please sit down and make yourself comfortable. No, 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 please, sir. Not that one. Over there. It is more comfortable. Gee, uh, thanks a lot. How many people have they disposed of in this way? And she's chuckling before Mike's even sat down. One day. This is too wonderful. I don't get it. You will. Whoa! Whoop! Mike's head looked like it was about to fall off there. It estimated that you would be here exactly seven minutes ago. And Beaker's very casually leaning against the violin cabinet. In a room, Mike, with no window. Still with his umbrella and bowler hat. In fact, Mike, we have fallen into a perfect trap. So, we have two now. I will deal with them in the usual manner. While I'm doing this, prepare the film to be delivered to us. What is the usual manner, I want to know? Uh, Dr. Beaker! I know what's about to happen next, but I don't know what would happen to the bodies afterwards. Do you see a valve on the wall of the room you are in? Uh, yes, uh, I see it. Then watch closely, Dr. Beaker. Oh, there's an obmarked gas. It's about to be settled, Dr. Beaker. Mike! <laughs> I... gas! Of all the fiendish things! <gasps> I... I have a little scheme, Mike. I'm glad to hear it, Doc, because for once I haven't. You, are you could always block the uh, gas nozzle. Wear bowler hats. 
you know, put your finger over the nozzle or something. It's not that big. Beaker to supercar. Over. Hello, Dr. Beaker. This is Jimmy. I can hear you. But it sounds like... Well, I don't know. It sounds like you're talking through your hat. <laughs> yes. Actually, Jimmy... I Shut up, you little twerp. I wouldn't call you for help unless it was absolutely vital. Go to the emergency channel and call the police. Tell them to come straight away to this building. Okay, Dr. Baker, I'll do that. Once I've rescued Mitch... Just do as I say, Jimmy. We are in a little bit of a hurry. You can say that again, Doc. I don't know about you, but this gas is beginning to get me. Put your finger over the nozzle. Here, it's not that big. That I doubt, Mike. Now, <coughs> where did I put my umbrella? Oh, no. At a time like this, he's worried about his umbrella. <laughs> Mr. Brudensky is just uh, not listening to any of this at this point. Valuable piece of equipment. <coughs> He, he gasses people and then presumably has to dispose of the bodies, which is quite dark for a supercar episode. Well, but this, my dear fellow, <coughs> is a very special umbrella. Ooh. Watch. Hey. <laughs> Good for you, Doc. Satisfactory. Most satisfactory. Yep, he's drilling through the lock with his umbrella. It's a very, very uh, well produced uh, pose from the puppet there as he's pressing the drill against the the lock and again it's a very sort of john steed kind of thing before that was even a thing of having weapons and concealed gadgets in his umbrella and now i have one or two things to attend to and then we will leave and deliver our secret film to the foreign government which pays us the most money <laughs> and in a generic foreigners pay the best money we'll have done its job on our meddling friends Dr. Beaker and Mike Mercury will be no more. <laughs> hmm. Hurry, Doc. We can't last out much longer. All right, Mike. We are nearly <coughs> through. It's the world's slowest working gas, but again, that nozzle could just be covered. It's going to present a serious problem. Oh. I mean, coat. Oh, no, 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 no. Everyone has mink codes these days. And who should arrive in the office now? <coughs> Here he is. The backup crew. <laughs> I love I loved Mitch. I know I probably shouldn't. But I especially love Mitch when he is in an uncontrollable rage. Go away. I am so frightened. <laughs> Herman, come back quickly. It's an escaped gorilla. And Mitch has maneuvered her onto the, uh, the trick chair. Never mind that. One thing for sure, you won't. Not where you're going. Yeah, and furthermore, if you want our friend to calm down, please don't refer to him as a gorilla. He is a chimpanzee, madam. <laughs> and a very Mitch is shaking his fists in barely controlled frustration. Found out. Okay. Oh, I also like that Mike and Beaker look quite sweaty here from their ordeal. He will be back soon. Okay, then we'll wait for him. Aha. Uh -huh. We'll wait for the criminal mastermind. I always make it a practice, Mr. Mercury, Ooh. not to keep people waiting. However, this time it is unavoidable. In a little while, our agent will be arriving, and then you will be coming with us. It'd be a nice twist if uh, Popkiss was the agent, giving him a reason for not being in the story, other than uh, George Marcel being busy with other work. If only the police would arrive. Or you could do something. I must go down and show them the way. Because the police can't do anything without me. I can hear their sirens now. It's a pity you did that, Mike Mercury, because you have signed your own death warrant. Again. You see, Mike Mercury. We have a secret exit from the building. Yeah, now they're both on the trapdoor. But Mitch, in his infinite wisdom, I would have liked to have shown it to you. Has spotted the controls. Goodbye, my friends. <laughs> Good show, Mitch. Well, though interestingly, the prop that Mitch jumped on had buttons one, two, and three rather than one, two, and trap. Yes, Jimmy, we're okay. But he sent them down to the gas-filled basement. Stay here, Mike. They're on their way up now. Good boy, Jimmy. They're just in time to take our two friends away. Assuming they haven't escaped through the door that we removed the lock of. 
So, back home. And uh, as this is the, the final episode of the first series, maybe they felt there, there probably weren't going to be any more, so there's a couple of bits of uh, rather indulgent stock footage in this episode, but I kind of accept it. It's quite, it's quite sweet. Anyway, we're now here to watch to see the film we've made, Doctor Baker. The film of the supercar team. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to tell you all about supercar. Ah. Well, it's also upside down. Now, who's a fool? Ah, and on that note, we end Supercar Take One, which has always been one of my favourite episodes of the show. I think it's uh, a favourite for a lot of people, really. If this was the, the note on which the series was to end on forever, then uh, it's a pretty strong one to go out on. Again, it's the show dealing with fairly big ideas of this, uh, this international spy ring, but the way... Oh, story by Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. Um, was this one they wrote, or is that one they've... Uh, just taking the credit on anyway yeah um a, a fairly big idea realized within the the fairly narrow uh, confines of the show's format but it always works very well any uh, episode focusing on on beaker and his uh, latest hobby is uh, always enjoyable it's nice to see the show sort of focusing on its own uh, it, on itself at the end its own glories its own success and uh, if this was to be the end it was uh, a jolly good last romp Ooh, I mean, a classic. Yeah, who, who didn't sing the theme tune? Well, hmm? do you know what my favourite bit at the end of the theme is? Yeah. When he just does that final, Supercar! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know right. why, it's such a really... Supercar! Supercar! <laughs> bum, 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 ba -dum. It's just such a lovely kind of jolly... Ex I couldn't get yes. more excited, here is the peak! <laughs> That's so, right. Yes. Anyway, a yeah. lovely bit of classic Anderson there. Very classic. And obviously yeah. uh, featuring our very own uh, Richard James. Well, if there was ever to be a live action supercar, uh -huh. clearly Richard James would play the yes. role of Mike Mercury. That's right. Yes. And I would play yeah. Master Spy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would. Yes, I'll try and I'll try and find the photograph and post it again. Uh, yes, yeah, you must do. Chris will be back next week, hopefully a bit less dirty and filthy. Yes, make sure you've showered before next time, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, with another randomizer <laughs> in Pod One Six Nine, where we'll be doing all the usual stuff like we just have for this one, because that yeah, seems exactly. to be the way this goes, doesn't it? <laughs> that's, that's the way it pans out week after week. Ah, we just keep talking. Okay, uh, Richard, anything before we wrap up? No, I think that'll do me. Yeah, it'll do me as well. Uh, Podstrons, yeah. email us, podcast at gerryanderson.com. Dot com. I almost said dot .co.uk. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it, actually, that's because it still says it in the script, so we'll have to correct uh, that. Right. Uh, but yeah, podcast at gerryanderson.com. Make sure you pop along to get all these exclusives and exciting things at uh, yep. shop.gerryanderson.com. Uh, almost yep. forgot that one as well. And, and also, do get in touch if you're as surprised as I am that there is actually a script as Jamie just alluded. <laughs> it's very yeah. vague. It's very vague. It is very vague. It uh, just gives us some vague structure, yes. Anyway, right. Uh, that's enough of this. We'll be back yes. uh, in Pod 169 next week. Yeah, How exciting. Okay. And uh, All right. uh, have a great week till then, Podstron. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. I'm waving. Are you? Oh, yes, I thought you were drowning. One complete. Let's go. Spectrum is green. <laughs> I was going to leave you. Oh, oh, how rude. Oh, rude. How rude. How rude. Uh, so what do you got planned for the rest of the day now? Oh, well, I'm going to sit down, I think, and uh, after a spot of lunch, I might turn my attention to something that I promised to you about four weeks ago, and I still haven't you got around to finishing. Did. I'm so sorry. So, uh, <sighs> yes, I think that's the plan, and it will be with you shortly, Mr. Anderson. I okay, well, I, I, I greatly respect... <sighs> Yeah, yeah. Four week 
delay there. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I thought. Exactly. Um, well, it's like the famous uh, Douglas Adams quote, isn't it? About, uh, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing noise they make as they whip past. Yes, anyway. yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> that's fine. Well, I, you know, we're, we're, we're all very busy, but I look forward yeah, yeah, to receiving yeah. your submission. Yes. In Exciting, course. isn't it? Yeah, well, Indeed. Uh, the Postrons will be thrilled when they hear about it. Oh, I should cocoa. Yeah. Right, OK, you go and sit down, then do yep. some work. All right, right. then. Good okay. luck. All Bye. Right. See you later. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. 